trends usually don't influence my decisions. Uh, I usually go for long-term longevity and a uh, good location because you can't change that. Hello, and welcome to Sink or Swim, a bi-weekly podcast brought to you by RentSync, where we provide an insider's look into the prop tech, multifamily, and rental housing industry. In each episode, we take a deep dive into the technologies and strategies that have helped companies overcome operational challenges and increase the value of their multifamily investments. So without further delay, let's get into today's discussion. Welcome back to Sink or Swim. I'm Mitch Fanning with RentSync, formerly LWS. And joining me today is Alan Drulo, president of Drulo Holdings, a family owned business that has been developing, constructing and managing apartment buildings for over 60 years. Alan? Thanks a lot for having me, Mitch. It's awesome. So I think we're going to cover a lot of ground in really such a short period of time. And normally what I would do is I'd ask somebody, uh, the guests to actually expand on that intro. But since you've been in the business, uh, you and your family have been in the business for 60 plus years since 1958. And, you know, you're well known in the industry. Um, I thought we could kind of forego that. But I think what's interesting is you seem to also at the same time keep a pretty low profile. And when I was kind of doing some research for uh, this talk today, I noticed that uh, your father, Eugene uh, Drulo, uh, who, who founded the company and, and uh, passed away uh, in 2018, was obviously equally as influential, uh, but he also kept a low profile. Um, so here's, here's my question. Um, is this something that, did your dad influence you in that way? Uh, and if so, or if not, what what are some of the other traits that uh, you admired about your dad? Well, absolutely. He did influence me in that way. Uh, um, we've always been uh, low key, do our thing of building and renting and, uh, you know, not really pay much attention to uh, what everybody else is doing. And uh, uh, I kind of learned that the hard way too, when I graduated biz school at Ivy, uh, one of my first tasks, we were launching a new building in a, a smaller town and uh, I did radio interviews with uh, um, the local uh, radio people and uh, uh, announcing the, I thought the good thing of the new building and uh, the new opportunities for jobs and the uh, uh, opportunity for new homes uh, getting built. And it was uh, in a time of economic downturn. And uh, uh, so I did my thing, and the the next day, my mother, who was head of property management, because this was it is truly a, a family business, uh, was getting all kinds of calls from our tenants in that town, saying, "Well, since we're so big and all that, they didn't need to pay our rent." <laughs> uh, and uh, I was totally hearing about that for the next uh, several months. So uh, I learned my lesson in humbleness uh, early on, and uh, uh, have stuck to it to that extent. So. And then the other thing that I always, uh, you asked about other traits, I always admired um, the fact that he was a builder. He, he was a bricklayer at uh, training and uh, his whole thing was to build and uh, that was his task to, and to house people at the end of the day. And uh, through that, uh, I learned about his perseverance and, uh, you know, uh, also to be able to uh, control your own destiny at the end of the day. So uh, make your own things happen and, uh, that's kind of what I took out of all the different aspects of the day-to-day life of trying to get uh, something approved through a city, then actually get things built uh, and achieved with all the obstacles that come along, uh, whether they're obstacles or detours uh, or even uh, troubles or issues. Uh, Things always happen on a job site uh, and uh, you got to be able to pivot and uh, come up with a solution. And I think that's uh, what I took away from all of that. So it's interesting. I mean, obviously, you learned a lot, a lot from your dad. Uh, you, you graduated Ivy Ivy League uh, School of Business at Western Ontario. I think it was eighty six. So yep. you know, you know, you've got a father who you know you you kind of learned a lot from. You got a good education, uh, but you chose to go into the family business. So, so what what made you decide to do that? I think uh, um, I tried different things uh, when I was going through. I could have gone through for engineering. Uh, um, I was really good at uh, computer programming and all of that uh, as well. I have a good knack for that. 
but at the end of the day, I, I enjoyed the building and uh, that's what made me uh, stick to it. Uh, something at the end of the day that you produce that's going to be there for a long time. And uh, it just happens to house people as well, which is a, a really neat thing in my world. So uh, um, I thought uh, that was a good way to spend my time and my efforts. Yeah, and I, I said I wasn't going to go off script, but, you know, you kind of mentioned the, the computer engineering and, and uh, you know, things being tangible. And you and I actually worked together um, years ago uh, when I worked with LWS as a partner, uh, and we kind of did some work on your on the Ironstone building. And that's one thing I, I remember about you is you were very uh, hands-on in a good way and really understood, you know, and, and really saw the importance of marketing and it's digital marketing specifically. And uh, that's something I always remembered about you. Um, switching gears, obviously COVID, you know, has caused urban rents to drop while in secondary markets, uh, rents uh, seem to be increasing. A lot of your properties and, and developments are obviously in secondary markets. So really the question is like, how long do you, do you uh, see this, this trend uh, lasting? Well, uh, you know, it's a good question. I really don't know what the crystal ball will hold as far as how long, uh, whether this is a real change or whether it's just a blip, because it really kind of depends on how COVID develops and how it keeps going and affecting our society. But um, I think the big thing for everyone to remember is that, you know, purpose-built rental is a, like a long-term investment and, you uh, um, it's not something that uh, I view for trends. Uh, trends usually don't uh, influence my decisions. Uh, I usually go for long-term longevity and uh, good location because you can't change that. And uh, so I'm kind of thinking, you know, long-term, uh, it's still a great investment because people still need to be housed. And uh, um, it's just going to come down to, uh, you know, how we can keep it affordable for everybody and uh, so that we don't price ourselves out of the market. So uh, um, that's where my efforts and my goal now is just to figure out how to uh, keep producing given COVID, given um, the government constraints on uh, supply. So uh, um, how we plow forward and persevere in uh, my dad's words. So, so, you know, obviously as a result of COVID, there's been, you know, you know, a lot of businesses and people, as you mentioned, have been negatively affected. But, you know, in your operations, has there been any positives that you can speak of? Or even said another way, you know, are, are, were there any beneficial changes in your operation that uh, from, say, an innovative level that you'll uh, you'll continue with in the future? Yeah, I, I think uh, it's an interesting perspective. I think you had to make you maybe think about that one. Um, I think Zoom, you know, uh, Zoom was not in my life uh, at all uh, before the lockdown. And uh, my IT department came up with Zoom as a good opportunity to meet all my staff and keep connected with them because, you know, uh, for my goal is always going out to the job sites and talking to the people, uh, uh, the employees and the subcontractors. And uh, when we weren't able to do that or it wasn't wise to do that, and still we're still constrained, I'll say, you know, we turned to Zoom to have the communication and kept uh, things going, especially with uh, the rapidness of uh, change, both locking down and then uh, the rapidness of unlocking with, you know, every announcement that Ford made, uh, uh, Premier Ford made, it's like a whole new event for us times 40 or 50 buildings or 60 buildings, depending on what got affected, whether it was a swimming pool getting locked down or opened up or a fitness room getting locked down or not. Uh, um, there's all kinds of issues. Every time he had an announcement, uh, we were reacting and scrambling because everybody expected us to have the answer the next minute. So yeah. it was an interesting perspective. So Zoom facilitated all that, allowed us to communicate what our ideas are to everybody in a, in a fast, meaningful way with interaction. So people could ask questions. So, uh, you know, that really did change uh, the fundamentals because, you know, other than people randomly running into me, my staff, uh, 
they didn't have a regular thing. So now we have regular Zoom meetings with the exact teams and things like that. Uh, uh, um, so they've got a whole lot more of uh, me time out of uh, this uh, in their eyes. I don't know if that's positive or negative, hopefully positive <laughs> from their point of view. But uh, so, yeah, that's something we'll probably keep on going with uh, um, from that perspective. Yeah, I was going to ask, actually was the next question was, do you think when this is kind of, you know, once we get to a point where we, we can uh, kind of, um, you know, be in person uh, more safely, do you think you'll continue it? That was kind of my, my follow up. Absolutely. It's just, a, it's an, I find it's an efficient way. So I'm not traveling from place to place uh, and everybody's not traveling to me either. So, because uh, um, we're, across five different cities. So, uh, you know, all of a sudden my property management team can get together on a regular basis without uh, causing people drive time, whoever it is, whether it's them or me or both. Yeah. So switching gears again. So this question actually came from uh, somebody that you and I both know, uh, Peter Cook from First National. And uh, the question he had for you was, uh, you know, how do current interest rates impact your decision to uh, so one build new multifamily and uh, and two really how do you manage the risk of interest rates potentially rising uh, during the, the during the construction period? Like what you hear so far? Make sure you never miss a show by clicking the subscribe button now. This podcast is made possible by listeners like you. Thank you for your support. Now back to the show. I, I think uh, um, I go back to that's a, a long-term play for us. Yeah. So uh, we're not making our decision to go or not based on interest rates. We don't pre-lease. So I'm able to react to whatever the consequences are in the marketplace at the time we bring the product to market. So, uh, you know, if interest rates are higher, but interest, the rents will be higher uh, to accommodate for that or, uh, you know, costs go up, I can adjust. I haven't locked myself in two years in advance uh, to do that. I learned that a while ago that you can't, you have to have your uh, revenues match your expenses or your uh, costs, however you want to look at those. And uh, um, that was our solution is uh, we late, wait to the last minute uh, um, some people consider that a uh, gamble because the, you don't have any security. But when you're renting 9,000 units on a regular basis, you have a regular, what I'd call rental flow, and you have an understanding of the marketplace and you know what to expect on a daily basis. So it, uh, I'm, it's not like I'm coming to the market never knowing what, it, uh, how long it's going to take me to rent a unit. Uh, I totally know all those statistics because I've experienced them in all my uh, uh, properties every day. So uh, I have security and knowledge of my own performance. Uh, so I don't have that worry or uh, there is no risk in my mind when I'm bringing a fully empty building to the market uh, to rent uh, ready to go in a month for occupancy for argument's sake. And uh, yeah, and it's the other thing too is uh, um, managing interest rates. Uh, you know, for us, it's uh, I learned when I graduated at a university that uh, I came into a, a down market and fresh off of uh, the chairman of our bank uh, visited us earlier a year or two and said that we were under leverage and we should eat, uh, uh, should uh, borrow more to build more. And we did that uh, to uh, grow faster. And then the downturn came and then all of a sudden that same bank was uh, changing their uh, attitude towards us. And uh, so that was a year of stress that uh, both my dad and uh, I uh, got initialized in, made me learn to uh, turn the banking and uh, loaning of money into a commodity. So uh, it's, for us, it's not about a partnership because the partnership's only one way when you uh, um, have all of that, uh, w when their board of directors makes a decision, you know, they're just even though you have a relationship with your banking manager, the higher up is what prevails. So uh, to me, it's a one-sided relationship. So we turn them into a commodity and uh, we don't rely on building for them. We're self-reliant. Uh, fortunately, we're, my dad put us into that position. But uh, so the point is that uh, um, I'm not looking for a bank's permission to build. So uh, uh, we have it aligned and uh, already planned out how we're going to achieve it. And then we go out and achieve. And, and then when we're done, we, uh, we've already proven our case. 
and then we get a, a mortgage takeout kind of thing at the end of that. So, uh, so yeah, so we're not uh, uh, kind of like the normal banking scenario. So I don't know if that was what Peter was thinking I was going to say, but. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, he'll definitely be listening in on this because uh, uh, I've asked him, I asked him to kind of give some questions. So it's funny because so two things I got from that, just being like, you know, in terms of how you think uh, different about things, obviously you're thinking like almost, I would call it leasing in real time versus pre-leasing when you're doing the lease up. And and two, when you said the down market, were you talking about the 80s? Is that when yeah, you- 80, Yeah, 80s, yeah. 80, yeah. So, and, and it's interesting because, I mean, when I was when I was buying real estate, uh, when I was uh, kind of a small uh, landlord, you know, we were always kind of, when I was learning about it, we were always taught to be a partner with, you know, have, have the banker as our partner. So it's interesting that, you know, the way you kind of think about that. So it's definitely uh, an alternative. So- so let's switch gears again. So obviously a lot of your properties, they are, you know, even just looking uh, up on the website and I, I know uh, that they're very luxurious. They're very, you know, put together. Um, but you're also an advocate for, you know, affordable housing options. Um, so my question is, you know, why is advocating for affordable housing so important to you? Well, I, I think it's a couple of things. One, uh, my dad was an immigrant, so uh, I respect the immigrant uh, uh, process and journey. I think that uh, there needs to be a continuum of housing from starter to find uh, people affordable housing uh, all the way up to those that uh, can choose whatever they want and uh, uh, all the in between. Uh, my dad was always a big advocate of uh providing larger units for value. Um, and I still believe in that as well. Whereas kind of today's model is minimize square footage to maximize the square, uh, the price yeah. point kind of thing. But since we're our own self performers, our own builders uh, to add a little bit of square footage, uh, if the space allows, I mean, right now it's down to the, the sites and the size that the yeah. cities allow us. It's more not my, my choice anymore. It's more about what I can fit uh, and still economically works for us. And uh, uh, those are more drivers than uh, uh, they used to be. So, uh, and also things like urban design where they actually want small footprints. So they're actually choosing to, uh, as a city, that they want units that are small as opposed to our value system of providing a bigger unit uh, so people can live comfortably. But uh, so I'm not always at odds uh, with urban design and uh, you can ask any urban designer who's met me uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, that uh, uh, we're always kind of going back and forth and bantering what's right for my biggest thing is I all feel that uh, I'm an advocate for the person that actually has to live in the unit because if they're happy and they're willing to pay me my rent, Whereas the city and the urban designers are more about what it looks like on the outside and how it looks to the guy driving by. And I really take uh, exception to whether really we should be lopping off a lot of square footage uh, to make the unit look good, like make the exterior look good and, and, and have a, what people call a point tower or whatever uh, their opinion is on things. And uh, we don't pay attention to the inside and make sure it's livable and uh, uh, a large enough space for somebody uh, um, to uh, use, utilize. So that's kind of where my head's been at. And that's why I go for the affordable housing thing is uh, we've built some affordable housing, one to understand it, uh, you know what the programs are. So, you know, with me being on the FERPO exec, uh, we talk to the governments on a regular basis that uh, I can know, have firsthand knowledge. And also, uh, you know, just to see how that actually works in the end has been an advantage to understand. And then also, I believe that it's for the good of our own health of our industry that, uh, you know, that there is affordability uh, baked into the system, however that gets achieved so that uh, the governments don't feel the need to uh, impose uh, um, what they view as the better thing for the industry. So uh, kind of uh, uh, looking at it from both ends from the point of view that uh, you know at the end of the day there's somebody that needs a home uh, and needs to be able to afford it and then uh, looking at uh, uh, the health of the industry from a point of view that uh, um, if we can meet those needs then the government won't need to interfere in uh, market uh, evaluation or like market uh, strengths kind of thing. 
Yeah, and obviously one of the other things you, I mentioned, I saw that you kind of commented on it uh, on LinkedIn was the zoning kind of impl implications of that as well. So, um, so you know, as we kind of come to a smooth landing here, I mean, I'm, I want to be respectful of your time. Um, you know, what what are your general out uh, or your general outlook for the multifamily market uh, moving forward in Canada? I think uh, the the market is strong. I, I think it's always going to be supply constrained. So uh, it's a good place to be in, uh, regardless of the economic blips that are along the way, including now. But uh, I do worry about uh, government uh, regulations and what it could do to our uh, industry uh, uh, with the oil foul swoop of the pen and uh, um, that's more concerning to me than the marketplace right now. So, okay, um, yeah, it goes back to kind of the one thing that you had kind of mentioned around the, the zoning. Um, so, you know, almost looking back now over the last thirty-six years since you know you graduated from from university, um, if you were to look back, um, you know, would you have done anything differently? I think uh, overall, no, from the point of view that all the bumps and tribulations that have got me here has been part of the journey to uh, make up how we do and operate today. So I don't think I'd change too much of that. The only thing I would have uh, um, probably revisited is, uh, you know, although it was, wasn't my decision at the time, was, uh, you know, that reference I made to the chairman of the bank saying that we should have borrowed more and uh, take his word on that. and. Uh, uh, then face a reality a few years later uh, that wasn't uh, of our making. So uh, I think that would have been, uh, but, you know, having said that, uh, it forced my dad and myself uh, as the person doing all the business plans uh, to get through the bank's questions, forced me to come, both of us to come to the conclusion of uh, creating our own uh, destiny and uh, um, having the finances ourselves to, to save up and, and arrange ourselves so that we didn't need a, a bank to go forward kind of thing and, and do the operate like operational mortgages yeah. as opposed to construction mortgages. So, you know, right now we didn't have we didn't stop construction or, or change any of the construction plans based on covid because we're not reliant on a bank saying yes so uh, you know we've launched a new building uh, uh just uh, uh three four months ago like um we also started a new building and uh, when i say launch we started rentals and we have two other projects or three other projects underway in the middle of it. So uh, still all going with uh, no hiccup other than the COVID hiccup as far as, you know, lockdown and uh, respecting all the uh, regulations that came down with that. So, yeah. And so, I mean, that being said, you know, you're obviously a busy guy. And if I keep you any longer, I know Anna, who works with you, uh, is probably going to be texting me to get you off. So, uh, we're going to just close by saying, listen, Alan, thank you very much for doing this. It was a pleasure. Always great talking with you. Uh, where can people find out a little bit more about uh, Drulo Holdings or even, uh, you know, your other company, uh, Ironstone Building Company that we, we didn't really get into, but where can people find out a bit more about those? So uh, DruloHoldings.com is our LWS website. So, uh, or rent sync website, I should say now. <laughs> I've getting used to the new moniker. So uh, um, that's uh, where to find out about us and opportunities there. And then uh, ironstonebuilt.com, uh, uh, which is the uh, Ironstone Building Company, which is kind of my single family and townhouse partnership uh, that uh, builds uh, those products and uh, um, uh, for sale products as well. Well, all for sale pretty much. And uh, um, yeah, so uh, uh, all kinds of different fronts. And again, that goes back to my whole thing about building for the continuum. So anywhere from single family to multi-res. So, and in Excellent. between. All right. Well, that's it. That's all. Um, again, thank well, you very much. Thanks, Mitch. That has been great. You've reached the end of another episode of Sink or Swim. Make sure to visit us at rentsync.com slash podcast to access show notes, key takeaways, and where you can sign up to our newsletter to receive free bonus content. If you found value in this show, please also remember to rate, review, and subscribe. That's this week's episode of Sink or Swim. Don't forget to join us next time for another jam-packed episode. Thanks for listening.